Hey, our third keynote speaker this morning, before we take questions, is Laura Fowler. Uh, Laura is here to uh, speak with us about things that uh, I'd hate to sum it up too much, but she's got quite a bio here, and I know she does a really good job, so I think I'll just turn the microphone over to her and let her go. Great. So I want to talk, I'm going to take the people side of the equation here and talk about conflict management amongst multiple stakeholders. Um, and give you a little bit of my perspective. I also come from a bullish standpoint of, hey, there's opportunities in this space. Uh, and Rob Minan reached out to me several months ago, a, a number of months ago and said, hey, would you be willing to come? I'm like, sure, happy to come talk about this. Um, so I come from the point that agriculture is incredibly critical, uh, not only for a, a addressing our food supply, I've worked in California quite a bit and I'll, I'll talk about one of those situations. Uh, we're not in good shape in California right now with our agriculture, but thinking about a diverse agricultural portfolio, but it's critical for water, for food, for energy production. I'll give you a picture. Um, I'm in central Pennsylvania now at Penn State. Um, you know, and this is a couple of our, our farmers, Dave and Mary Graybill, of really thinking about the environmental attributes of what they are doing. Uh, we've done a ton of stakeholder work uh, in Pennsylvania and across the country. One of the things that I would give you, one take home point, and I'm just to put this right out there, is we've got to be moving at the speed of trust. What does that look like? How do we work together to find solutions to really, really complicated questions? And I know we have a little bit between conflict and solution and back and forth and give you some case studies, give you a couple projects of what we're working on. Uh, and then, as they said before, we'll wrap up and answer questions from all three of us. So, disputes and conflicts. Um, Conflict may be a contest between competing interests, facts, ideas, and values of people. You've already heard, right, the need to think about where people are, the values that may be at play in something like that. Let me ask you a question. Do you think conflict is helpful, harmful? How many people, people think it's helpful? How many people think it's harmful? How many think it might be both? Okay. Uh, the Chinese character, the symbol for conflict is danger and opportunity. I think we're in both a dangerous and opportunistic opportun place right now. And what we do with it is actually up to us, how we actually decide what we're going to do and how we're going to proceed. I'm trying to, sorry, trying to catch the mic here. Uh, resolution. I don't think about solving some of these questions. When I work on water related questions, they don't go away. But working towards res resolution is, can you get to a place of healthy, productive relationship and handling those disputes uh, as they occur, right? You're not making them go away. We can't, in fact, solve flood or drought. Um, and I'll come to an example of that here in a moment. But we can think about ways to address and resolve them one way or another. Uh, I'll give you this picture. I was, I knew Lake Erie had significant impacts. I did not think I would find a picture as easily as I did of impacts in this area. Uh, this is 2019 and the, and the algae blooms. We are subject to a lot of wicked problems right now. But for example, uh, nutrient runoff and the different factors that the heating that led to these nutrient blooms, what do we do to fix them? Significant, significant question. More recent headline from last week that caught my attention. Uh, this is from Reuters News, no poop for you. Manure supplies run short as fertilized prices soar. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has brought home uh, that that's a part of the world where a lot of fertilizer is made. So we are very interconnected, um, but it's made questions about how do you actually capture the resources, for example, and reuse them. You've got somebody saying, hey, I wish I had more to sell. But there is, I, I am out of actual supplies uh, because this is being used as a substitute for fertilizer. Uh, it's also adding um, potential opportunities, for example, for spreaders and things like that. The economic development of this and again, integrating those solutions to some of those wicked problems or challenges is very, very real. Uh, so I often work um, jokingly in the valley of death. Right, the, the space between an idea and the implementation and how do you get there? That is where I've spent my whole career is in that valley in between. Uh, and it's often contentious, but it's also very, very rewarding when you can work with people to find solutions in that space that allow an idea to go all the way through to implementation and making money. And I'm gonna end actually with a couple slides that I thought you might find interesting on environment, social and governance investment, ESG investment, which you might've heard something about too. 
Uh, so let me give you a couple of frameworks. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom was the only woman who's ever won the Nobel Prize in economics, and she did so for a framework of common pool of resources. Basically thinking about, can you define the areas of what you're working on? Uh, can you get a proportional benefit, uh, excuse me, proportional benefits between costs and benefits? Uh, think about the time, place, technology, or quantity related to local conditions. Make agreements on how you're going to manage something collectively. And if something starts, you know, you need to monitor something over time. If something goes wrong, there's graduated sanctions, but you have dispute resolution mechanisms. You think about the right to organize and you're collectively working together to actually handle this. Interestingly enough, one of the case studies that I'm going to give you is where Eleanor Ostrom did her PhD work in the 1960s uh, in the groundwater basins of, of Southern California. I also think a lot about how engagement can be really, really helpful. Um, why negotiated or mediated facilitated processes allow you to figure out what you want as a solution. Not what somebody else wants, not somebody else deciding, but what you want. I'm a lawyer by training as a mediator and a facilitator. My bio mentions this, um, but I did water policy for the state of Oregon for a number of years before deciding to get an advanced degree because I wanted to be a water mediator. I wanted to help people solve questions. Um, so I work much more on the cooperative and facilitative side of this uh, dynamic where parties really decide the outcome uh, versus having a court or a judge or an adjudicator decide the outcome. And there's real value in that because you can come up with creative solutions that a court cannot mandate. And in our world of litigation, yes, I'm a lawyer. I sometimes admit it. I try not to. Um, the courts are pretty limited in the solutions they can come up with, but you as a collective group of stakeholders can come up often with something much, much more innovative by negotiating a solution yourself. Uh, designing a process is really, really critical. People are like, great, we get together in a room, we sit down and we talk through it. Mm -mm. A lot of work goes into this. This is actually a picture of my students in 2018, facilitating a local watershed forum in Spring Creek in central Pennsylvania. Uh, and what somebody can do in a neutral position is think about how do you convene? Who are the parties that need to come into the room? Uh, whatever room it may be, it may be a Zoom room more recently. What are the potential topics that are worrying people? I'll often ask, what keeps you awake at three in the morning? Uh, what's the potential role for mediation or facilitation? You know, do you need some help in having this conversation? Clarifying responsibilities, who has what role or responsibility to create a proposal or an idea? What are the ground rules, the role of a neutral in the process? How do you deliberate? How do you identify new information, exchange information? What do we know about the challenge that's in front of us today? And then how do you decide and implement a potential agreement? Um, I'll give you this framework. People wanna be talking about a substantive question. How do we handle dairy manure? How do we handle X, Y, and Z? Right? But they're often really stuck in a different part of this triangle, the people in the relationship. How many of you have heard somebody walk into a room, say something, and you just can't hear what they say because of who it is? That happened to me, raise your hand. That happened to most of us, right? So the people in the relationships, the messenger really, really matters, but so does the process. How do you get there? You're like, oh, okay, business as usual. You're gonna give us three minutes at a microphone to testify, but you're not really, really listening. So I spend a lot of time thinking about the substantive questions people want to deal with, but engaging with the people side of it and the process side of it. And I'll give you again some examples of how we've done that. A uh, lot of challenges, right? deep history, um, issues, values, lots of things at play. These are complicated situations, and we, we may be very good at working things out discipline by discipline. This requires us to talk between, and that's a hard space to work in, again, but also really, really rewarding. Uh, Framework five, I'll give you, people tend to think about positions versus interests. What do you think a position might be? Generation? Tell me more. Well, my, father had water rights. I, uh, my father had water rights, I get them, you know? What's the value or the interest behind that? Yeah, I have a water right, I'm gonna protect it no matter what. What might be the interest or value behind that? Just warn you, I'm a law professor and we use the Socratic method. I call on people in class. <laughs> Interest or value behind something like that may be, right? I wanna ensure that I have reliable water supplies for my farm or, or my production over time. It may be that I wanna make sure I have a legacy that I can hand down to my kids or grandkids or something beyond that, right? But people tend to talk in positions, not interests, and they tend to get stuck on, well, I don't want that. 
it's easy to break stuff. It's much harder to build it. Picture of uh, flooding in the Chehalis River Basin of Washington State in 2007. And the question that people were raising there was, you know, stop the flooding, build a dam, give me dynamite and I'll, I'll uh, blow up the Mellon Street Bridge because that's what's causing the flooding. Uh, I don't want a dam built. So very polarized and a big fight over it. What they were really wanting to talk about though was something different, which is health and safety concerns, community and economic development and viability. Um, impacts and access to things like power, electricity, uh, food, et cetera, uh, and many, many more uh, issues. So I would recommend the book, Getting to Yes, it's a classic negotiation book by Fisher and Urey. It's been around for a long time. It's not a thick read, but it talks about positions versus interests. And we're seeing that come up in this space all the time. I want, I don't want, is a hard place to have a conversation. Why? Help me understand more. Let's talk about the values behind it. Makes it much easier to have a conversation. Uh, a lot of wicked problems demand a lot of innovative solutions. I love this map of the United States. It's taking the rivers and waterways and putting them up as veins. And it takes away the state boundary lines. I work in that interdisciplinary space between and across boundaries. So let me give you a couple of case studies. Worked in Southern California and Los Angeles area over who gets to store and use groundwater in Los Angeles. And when I got sent down there, how many of you have seen the movie Chinatown? Couple people, if you're into film noir, it, it's a good film, it's quite excellent. I'd seen it before I went down there and I thought, oh, what am I getting sent into? You want me to figure out what and where? Now, this is an area, California, Central Valley of California. If you've flown into the Los Angeles airport, you're actually flying into an area that splits two groundwater basins. Uh, there's old reports from the 1800s that ships used to anchor off Long Beach and be able to put buckets into the water and pick up groundwater. This area was founded not because of anything other than the fact that there were actually a lot of artesian wells in the area. So if you look at place names in, in the cities in this area, it's 420 square miles, 43 cities. Some of them are Artesia, Lakewood, Santa Fe Springs. Why were the missions formed there? Because they could access the groundwater. In the 1940s and 1950s, you really pumped a lot of it, particularly for the ground or for the war effort. And you started seeing saltwater intrusion coming in along the coast. Uh, so 4 million people uh, when we were working on this, and they were using about 635,000 acre feet of water. An acre foot of water is one football field about a foot deep. Used to be people would say it's enough for a family of four for a year. Better water conservation, people say it's fam enough for a family of two for, or two families for a year. And the question was, how do you deal with this? California did not have a groundwater uh, management code until 2014. So they basically figured this out basin by basin when they ran into trouble. Again, this is the groundwater basin that Eleanor Ostrom did her PhD work on, uh, looking at it. And in the 50s and 60s, they basically said, we've got a really big issue. They took each other to court, they sued each other, and there were two different uh, court judgments, one in the central basin and one in the west coast basin. Um, we were brought in to say, hey, you know, we've leveled it at a certain point, but how do you use the empty space effectively sitting under the greater Los Angeles area uh, to store and use water? Our goal was legal certainty about who could put water in, who could take it out, and under what conditions. Simple task, right? Uh, so again, they basically stabilized it, but at a basin level below where they had and realized that they had done the calculations of about 450,000 acre feet of potential storage space. Pretty significant, especially if you compared it to the cost of building uh, Metropolitan Water District looked at building a reservoir at uh, 800,000 acre feet for $1.9 billion. Their existing pumping rights, you can see the difference in, in amounts. They were looking on a huge untapped swimming pool reservoir storage under the greater Los Angeles area. And you can imagine the benefit of actually figuring that out. Particularly in a wet year, this is the Los Angeles River. Uh, when it has water, it has a lot of water. It is a concrete ditch. They're working on trying to figure that out. It's a different question. And this is what it looks like in a dry year. Wet year, dry year. So the biggest question is when you got a wet year and you've got water flowing through that system, how do you take it, drop it into that bucket and in a dry year, take it out? Our role as mediators is working with a colleague was to figure out how to bring people together and talk about that. When we first got down there, they were like, whatever we do, we've tried a mediated process with a neutral third party having this discussion. Uh, we got into fights, don't put us in the same room. So we did a lot of shuttle diplomacy of talking with different groups to figure out like who's interested in this, what are the issues, how do you bring people together? 
I did a ton of the interviewing of different folks. And interestingly enough, everybody kept saying term limits in California. It's like, I thought I was here to talk about water. They're like, no, term limits. I'm like, why term limits? Why? Because you had a series of different water boards. Uh, interestingly enough, in California, if you're on a water board, you got paid to go to meetings and you got insurance and you got other benefits. And so water boards and education boards turned out to be a good place to gain expertise to get into the state assembly, or if you finished and were term limited out of the state assembly, a place to go. And so what you had after term limits came in is water boards, which had historically been run by the same people for 30 or 40 years, started to change and turn over. A lot more diversity, but a lot more fights over how to manage water. So super interesting, not what I would have expected to hear. Uh, but we worked with folks for about two and a half years to figure out what this potential set of solutions were. And interestingly enough, this is a little hard to read, but they basically all came together, minus a couple people, a couple different entities to say, yeah, here's the set of rules under which we can put water in and take it back out. Basically dismissed us and then spent the next couple of years trying to redo those judgments in courts and work with those couple of outliers that didn't agree. This is implemented, it is running. And as California is facing that 1200 year drought, it is actually part of what the solution is to managing water in this area. So case study number one, and I can go into more details. Case study number two, the beautiful picture of something completely terrible. What do you see in this picture? Not a lot of what you can see or should see. Yeah, so this is interstate I-5 uh, between Seattle and Portland. The Chehalis River Basin is midway between Seattle and Portland. If you've driven this road, you have driven through this area. Uh, but this is in 2007, they got about 18 inches in 24 hours of rain, that heaviest, heaviest precipitation. Folks in this area basically say, we don't know why, but we're the Bermuda Triangle of the worst weather on the West Coast. They have a hundred year history of flooding. Uh, and it had been getting worse and worse. And in 2007, they got hit by this catastrophic flood. They got hit again 18 months later in early 2009. And the question there was, how do you handle this? I think a lot about the spiral of conflict where something hits and it starts to spiral up. The conflict goes outside of the community and gets a lot harder to handle. About two weeks after this flood, uh, this is the front page on the New York Times, basically saying anger and blame for the Pacific Northwest flood, uh, bad logging practices. Everyone's like, what are you guys doing in this basin for how bad you're logging, right? That was not the only question that was at play here, but it was one question and it made this a much harder question to try and deal with. Again, 100 year history of trying to figure this out. And so what happened, you know, people were like, we need to stop the flooding. I talked with about positions versus interests before. It took us a while to figure out how to set up sets of discussions. I was a facilitator in this, uh, for this process uh, where we wanted to set up a workshop to talk about it. Somebody at, finally, it took us two years to set up a workshop. Somebody in that workshop said, there is no umbrella big enough to stop the flooding. We can't stop flooding. Somebody else paused and said, that's the wrong question. What we can think about is what are the impacts? How do we address them? Can we reframe this into a discussion that we can actually have? Can we meet other needs? The bottom picture, by the way, is the local airport. The planes parked on the highest area with the hopes that they did not flood. But people said, we also have a problem with drought. We have the flooding problem, we have a municipal problem, but we have an agricultural problem and a drought question. So we also have indigenous tribes in this area who are deeply worried about fisheries. And so counterintuitively made the problem bigger. Not just flooding, but drought and habitat and habitat restoration. So out of this has come and it's cut off a little bit, but the Chehalis Basin Plan uh, strategy for reducing flood damage and restoring aquatic ecosystems. And it was by combining those things and thinking about the system more holistically, we were able to start to move forward. Uh, so creation of a local flood authority, the governor at the time uh, basically said, look, I want this to be a, a local solution, a bottom-up solution to be able to find answers to this. Lots of lots of time spent in meeting rooms that look a lot like ones we've all been in, right? where people were coming together to sort through, bring information to the table and talk through this. Uh, direction from the governor to, to basically find these bottom-up solutions. Uh, money to help with process as well as projects. Um, 
So we, we started to think about where we were meeting. We rotated where we were meeting. We went on tours. Favorite thing to do is put on a boot, pair of boots, go get muddy and um, you know break for lunch afterwards and have a chance for a conversation where people can realize that there's a lot more commonality in what they're trying to do. A lot of reinforcement for those local processes. A lot and lot of stakeholders, not the least of which was the public who really cared about this. Everybody running for election was running on finding a solution to flooding. What you want a process to look like is something very methodical. You start, you work together, it works really hard. I spent one time, a lot of time drawing this sketch. This is really what it looks like. It is messy, it's sideways, it's up and down. It's a phone call at 6 p.m. on Friday night when something just happened, right? It is not linear. So kind of from very stuck and this isn't working to, oh, we're finally moving forward on this was about two and a half years or a hundred years, depending on how you think about it. Um, so you can see the headlines evolu evolving over time. You know, people feeling frozen out of the local flood group to, wow, we held a crucial flood policy workshop and people are coming together. When an unusual group of stakeholders who had historically hated each other walked hand in hand into the Washington state legislature and said, we all agree that here is a path to start moving forward. Not the perfect path, but a path. They got $28.2 million after everybody picked their jaws up off the floor. Why? Because they could collectively agree on the solution for what they needed in that basin. Same thing with the Los Angeles area. People were so surprised after years and years of fighting that there was a path forward, that they actually were trying to help move that forward. Uh, historic steps, you see the switch in the headlines, right? From intractable conflict to, wow, we're actually moving forward. Uh, finding ways to join forces and work together on what had looked like terribly difficult situations. A lot of time talking, right? Meetings, you can go look at all of the meetings, all of the minutes, <laughs> all of it is publicly transparent and open. Uh, again, tours, um, you know, we used a lot of ground rules, the use of consensus. Uh, I may not love something, but I can agree to allow things to go forward. Building conversation, again, I mentioned food already. Working to understand those underlying issues, values, concerns, fears. Uh, addressing each issue as it arose, and then working on small successes. Somewhere along the way, somebody in here said, hey, during the 2007 flood, all of our livestock, most of the livestock in the area died. Somebody said, I had to list, Dave Fenn, colleague in the area, was fifth generation dairy farmer, and he said, I had to listen to my cows drown because I couldn't let them go out and go up the hill fast enough. He's like, what if there was, I don't know, a critter pad? I was like, what's a critter pad? It's like, what if you had in the floodplain a pile of dirt that the cows could walk themselves up? And everyone's like, huh, I don't know, that's interesting. But what would this look like? So our local extension folks and our local ag folks basically calculated what this might look like. The question was, if you built a whole bunch of these, would it impact flooding and make it worse for other people? Answer was no, not really. So today there's something like 25 or 30 different critter pads built across this whole area low tech solution, but everyone's like, you listened to me, you took my idea seriously, you calculated the potential impacts, you built them. And I'll come forward because in 2022, January this year, they had another catastrophic flood. And I'll talk about the impacts. Um, but addressing uncertainty and note, the active listening of really engaging with where people were. Uh, hope, really critical, right? People have gone from, we can't do this, we're, this sucks, we hate each other, to, wow, we're really in this together and we're finally seeing hope that we can move this forward. Uh, led to recognition from the worst place to work on flooding in the US to recognition two years ago in Cleveland, Ohio, three years ago now, um, of the work that they were doing because they were all coming together uh, to be able to do this. And a range of projects from really small to really big. They are looking at potentially building a dam in the area, and there's a lot of analysis that's gone into that. Um, so the Shayla Space and Strategy, alive and well, very much working on it. They've had at least 39 large projects, and now at this point, about $50 million. I mentioned the 2022 flood. Uh, in January this year, a pretty catastrophic flood hit again. Uh, and they had a period of about three weeks where they were able to flood after flood after th flood. In 2007, $300 million worth of damage. And again, almost complete destruction of livestock in the area. 2022, $13.8 million worth of damage. They didn't stop it. They didn't solve it. But the reduction is enormous and much, much less impact to livestock, to manure operations, to you name it, right? Because they were finding ways to address those impacts all the way across the basin. 
uh, you know, the critter pads that I mentioned, upgraded pumps, upgraded sewer treatment plants, um, lots and lots of effort across this whole area. And this is a big, big area. Uh, so working on flooding has led to collaboration, not only on flooding, but on other questions because they had figured out how to deal with both the people and the processes to allow for more effective engagement. So education, transportation, COVID, uh, because they had those uh, connections across this basin. So I love this quote, you know, somebody saying, hey, we realize that we're not going to solve this. This is the mayor of Montesano at the time. This is several years ago saying we are all in this together. And we know that now. So I want to illustrate a couple of research projects and then talk about the money just a little bit and I'll wrap up. So we're working at Penn State uh, with folks from uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln and Arizona State on a project. We're just wrapping this up called Water for Ag. The radical idea that if you want to figure out water and agricultural questions, you'd go talk to the stakeholders uh, and, and ask. And it was really interesting because we actually developed five different local leadership teams two areas in uh, Pennsylvania, two in Nebraska, and one in Arizona, where we assembled the local leaders and said, what, do you, what are you concerned about with water and ag? And they're like, you're not here to tell us what we should be concerned about? We're like, no. You're not here to tell us what we should be thinking about? No. <laughs> so we convened them in each basin after they got over that sort of, well, what are we supposed to do? They started to realize that there were in fact questions that were of concern. So in Potter and uh, Tioga County and the Northern Tier in Pennsylvania, questions of, hey, we think the water is clean when it's leaving our area, but we wanna test that. We've done some follow-up work now in that area to do uh, some work with the US Geological Survey on, on water testing. In Mifflin County, uh, the dairy rich area in Pennsylvania, it was what's the potential for using cover crops to address some of these concerns. In Nebraska, in one area in Nebraska on the Platte, it was to really think about the management of Phragmites, an invasive species that was really affecting uh, people's access to water. They've actually developed um, a fund because they realized Phragmites management, invasive weed management fit between a lot of different groups and organizations. So they have a Nebraska community fund that they're starting to leverage actually much more systematic funding to address that. Uh, in Western Nebraska, they were working on things and kind of stalled out when a big piece of uh, irrigation infrastructure canal broke. They were like, hey, we've got the group ready who can actually think about solutions for this. And in Arizona, it was the question of how do we encourage better agricultural restoration work? Can we tie that to marketing and labeling? So you have a label with your products that basically say, this is Verde grown because you have met these certain standards, We're working on implementing that. So we're uh, wrapping up this project right now. Um, we're doing an end of project. Let's walk through this in detail uh, on May 10th, if you're interested in learning more about that project. Uh, but really interesting about, well, how does engagement actually work? The other project that we're working on uh, that fits exactly with what you guys are all thinking about, Penn State is partnered with Iowa State. Iowa State is the lead of thinking about regenerative agriculture. Can you combine, for example, manure uh, and anaerobic digestion with perennial grasses? If you think about the, the picture that was shown earlier of the floods, can you, instead of having uh, bare soil, can you have perennial grasses that you are periodically harvesting and adding it into the, the digesters to make renewable natural gas? Uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about California and the low carbon fuel standard and how potential markets might be able to grow in that space. Interestingly enough, countries like Finland are turning to renewable natural gas. So are a lot of places in the United States. Uh, so it's an interesting and really open space, not just in California, but across the whole of the US. So finally, I wanna to get to a little bit, um, this is not in the abstract of what I wanna talk about, but as I was putting these slides together, I was like, all right, let's talk about this. Because what I commonly hear is somebody says, I have a project, but I really need funding. I'm spending a lot of time following, and I've thought about getting a business degree, decided not to just follow people around, but I'm hearing a lot from the financial world. We have funding, but I need good projects. There is a big disconnect in between. And that disconnect is an interesting space, I think, actually, for, particularly for agriculture. Uh, ESG, environment, social, and governance, is exploding in terms of an investment space. Uh, this almost looks like climate charts, except this is money charts. It is money, global financial capital, looking to find projects that somehow fit in this space. Uh, 
U U.S. domiciled assets under management grew from 12 trillion at the start of 2018 to 17 trillion in 2020. I don't have more updated numbers. They're probably out there. I just didn't have a chance to find them. Uh, but what's this look like for agriculture? Agriculture is in the top five category. It's $2.38 trillion in 2020. Climate is the other space in this. Um, I'm happy to share the slides and the links to this, but follow the money. So a lot of international capital trying to figure out carbon sequestration and soil carbon and carbon markets. There is no standard definition right now in the United States of what ESG investment is. Europe is working on it, so is the United States. About two weeks ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission basically said, hey, if you are a company, you are going to have to disclose your climate impacts. It has collectively scrambled a little bit of the world of how do we calculate this? How do we implement this? But people are very much looking to agriculture as part of the solution in this space. And there is a ton of money, but you got to be able to articulate the project of what you're trying to do. So I give you this, um, this is the rule I use in, for myself in mediation and working with people is don't get mad, get curious. Give you Yoda. Uh, you know, if you're afraid of something, if you fight or if you're really uh, kind of pushing against people versus trying to really understand, it can lead to that kind of hatred and anger. Um, but if you can turn that around and come from a place of curiosity of saying, hey, we all have something to contribute on this, then maybe we have a chance to move things forward. So with that, I will stop. Thank you, and we welcome questions. Question back there. Yes, um, I have a question for Laura uh, about the facilitated process, um, and especially when it involves um, uh, funding that is coming to a restoration or a project. Is the, do you perceive type of conflict between different stakeholders about who's allotted more in the funding or who is uh, who's heard more in, in essentially it's a to a degree, a net zero uh, or a, a zero sum game, especially for some, or how do you overcome that issue of allocating resources to solve individual stakeholder interests or priorities? Yeah, great question. I think people do view it as a zero sum game. I win, you lose, you get something, I don't get anything. Um, and what I would tell you is that if, again, it takes a bit of work, quite a bit of work to sit down let me back up a little bit. For every major process I've worked on, it tends to be a couple people who said, you know what, there's a different way. I don't know what it is, but can we sit down and have a beer? Can we have a cup of coffee and talk through this? There's always like two or three people who, who are critical thought leaders who are able to help bridge that gap in every single process, right? Big, small, doesn't matter. I've worked on some enormous, enormous questions and it always comes down to who are those leaders who can sit down and say there's a better way and get past the, if you win, I lose. But what's the win for all of us here? People talk about win-win solutions, but again, there's this mentality of a limited pie. What I would tell you, and the reason I showed you the numbers from the Shehelis Basin is when they were able to get past that, and those unusual stakeholders were able to come together hand in hand into the legislature, it was easier to allocate money, right? Because people were like, great, you actually have solutions. Let's put this towards that. And that is just the state money that is not talking about the federal money that has also come into this space. So interestingly enough, just to dive a tiny bit into that, you know, partway through that, it, you know, show us the models, show us the information. We realized there we were working with a model of H&H &H model, a hydraulic hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, water coming into the system and water flowing through the system. That was a black box. Nobody could unpack it. It had been done in the 90s. Everyone was like, we don't trust it. So we reached a, a stark place where we we're like, crap, we got to actually redo this model. And to redo the model literally means sending people out to take new transcripts and to rebuild it from scratch. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers said, well, we've got money. We have $750,000 to redo this. The state has money. And so we were headed down the path of two competing models. And a colleague basically said, let's not. Let's see if we can pool our resources. So we had an interesting behind the scenes discussion, right? To talk with the people chosen by the Corps and the people chosen by the state to say, hey, would you, could you combine your effort? Turns out they'd always meant to be working together and never had a chance. And they were perfectly happy to do so. So two $750,000 models became one $1.5 million model that as people were developing, they could 
they could trust. They knew what assumptions went into it. They knew how to work it. They knew how to ask those questions. So they have that much, much better informational foundation that came out of pooling those resources. So I guess I always take the, yeah, you may think it's a zero sum game, but where do you pull those resources? How do you pull people together? Not easy, but great opportunities. The other thing I would tell you very quickly is press really loves to cover conflict. It's much harder to find where people are finding solutions and it's happening all over the place. Great work is happening all over the place, but you have to go find it. It's not gonna be the front page of the paper. When things in the Shehali space and started going better, the press stopped coming. We had to write our own op-eds to say, yeah, this is making a difference. You started to see those big signs. Why? Because we needed to be telling taxpayers that their dollars were being well spent, but it was incumbent on us to share that success. You can't wait for somebody else to share your story, but you also means you've got to go find it. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, I've got two hours worth of questions for the speakers. I, th I thought they were all great, but I'm just going to limit it to one with Laura. Um, so what I got from your presentation was, and, and I know it was all compressed, the one about the flooding in uh, Oregon, um, it was how you protect yourself and how you protect the stakeholders, like the, the high ground for the cattle and things like that. Any solutions on stopping the flooding to begin with? Yeah, deal with climate change. <clears throat> okay. So so we're we're dealing with how do we how do we live with it? Yeah. And and it would go to the first presentation, right? Climate change is water change. It is more flood, it's more drought. We are seeing it all over the country. We're certainly seeing it in Pennsylvania, you know. I'm corn crop. I don't like drought, 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 flood. When I'm talking with other people who are modeling this stuff, they're like, average, you've got more precipitation. I'm like average doesn't help me if I'm a corn seedling. I want reliable and predictable and we have none of that. So I, you know, I'm working on the adaptation side, but the mitigation side, the reduced greenhouse gas emissions, hugely, hugely important for more consistency in this space. We can't stop the flooding without dealing with climate issues. We're going to take one last question and then we're going to want to, we need a break to recognize the student posters. So go ahead, Ling Ying. Hi, my question for Lara. Very interesting. We're impressed to see how you can, you know, change your uh, position to interest to find the innovative solution. You had the research, you have some great example. And I also like to see you, you know, use the Chinese to, uh, but I have a question. I think I'm mean, also, um, yeah, it is good. We like to see this, uh, happy ending, good solution with deep listening and deep engagement with different stakeholders. I'm interested to see your, 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 your map kind of blurring the state boundary things. But think about <clears throat> in a large scope, this currently Ukraine, you know, Russian walls, geopolitical boundary. I hope to see this, you know, blurred boundary between countries in the globe. Think about all this water, air, climate change, virus, they are the same. So how, I mean, my question is, how do you apply your research theory, you know, engage all the stakeholders of the globe in a large scale? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, so I had the privilege of, of getting a Fulbright scholarship to go to Sweden two years ago. And so from August of 2019 to August, uh, May of 2020, we were living in Stockholm. And I took my questions and said, where are people finding solutions to complex water questions, both water quality in the Baltic and the Chesapeake and water quantity, flood and drought. And it was really, really fun because the questions in Denmark, for example, you know, when I was talking with them about manure and dairy and lagoons, they were like, we cover all our lagoons. It's not the same issue. And we're producing renewable natural gas, right? Like to go exploring and to find out what's happening elsewhere, people all over the world are working on this. And even last week, I actually taught a via Zoom, a, a class in Sweden, working with students from Ukraine, uh, you name it, right? The questions are the same. How do you bring people together to find those common interests and to start to find solutions? I don't know how to fix global warming globally. I do know how to deal with it locally. I like watersheds because they're a little more confined. Mississippi is an exception, right? But smaller sub watersheds, because I can work with a defined group of people. Go back to Eleanor Ostrom and sort of that 
Where are those boundaries? And by working collectively locally, you can start to deal with those global questions, be it in Ukraine or elsewhere. Ukraine is obviously a challenging situation, but it was eye-opening to me how much of a breadbasket they are. Uh, I also teach energy law, and so thinking about the energy dynamics. But again, the biggest solution we can actually enact, I think, for Ukraine is being able to think about uh, our own use of energy. And some of that, again, comes from things like renewable natural gas. So how do you how do you balance the local and global issues? I usually start locally.